Hey, welcome back to PEMF certification and training. This is week four, treating injuries and wounds with our guest speaker, Christina Cooper. Thanks a lot for joining us. And um, we're gonna go right to the replay from last, the, the very first course with our conversation with Christina. Yay! Yay! We are here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this was a hard way to go. I guess, <laughs> I guess you don't try to do too many new things at once, like changing the time. That was a challenge. And then putting in these new earbuds. And I got to get these new earbuds. They were supposed to be really good, but I guess they're not working. So, um, so anyway, we've got... Christina Cooper here from Freezing, Wisconsin. Christina, that is an understatement. <laughs> what's the temperature there? Um, when I left the barn, it was negative twenty-one, not counting the wind chills. No. Oh. Um, it actually says um, negative. You can't see that, but that says negative forty-four right there. <laughs> oh, I can see that. <laughs> That's, so that's just, a field like temperature. That is so that's and it's just gonna get worse. Like that's not where I live, we're supposed to bottom out around negative sixty-three. So Oh my god. That is why we <laughs> moved to North Carolina. That is why I'm we moved. From Florida. I'm from <laughs> uh, what are you doing there? Oh uh, yeah. That's Living crazy. The dream. Well, we're here to, we're happy you're here and to, we're going to try to warm you up with all our positive energy and um, you have done an amazing job at um, really taking the whole uh, PMF protocol um, way beyond what was previously thought possible and um, you have got some great research and the way that you did it and, and all that and, and um, we have a, a video that you're going to share with us. Um, but first, I, I really want to say this is a, just a prime example, and um, just really the reason why we're all here is because the way that um, we move forward with with our um, with PEMF and our careers and our life is by building on other people's success and taking advantage of other people's. Um, experience and the otherwise we're just starting all over like when we bought our first machine we didn't know what we were doing we took this test before we even uh, got it out of the box and um, I put it on Sherry and almost electrocuted her the first time and sent her like it was on full blast and I put it on her back and she went flying and then I asked, uh, I asked Pat Zemer after we did the, the certification test, Pat Zemer with, with MagnaWave, after I did the certification test, um, so, you know, what's the training? He's like, ah, training, you know, you just go out and use it on 50 horses, you'll get the hang of it. And that was my training. And, and uh, so that was everybody's training, and nobody knew what they were doing. They're just like waving the magic wand around. And... Um, <clears throat> one of the major, major limitations that I had with all the different manufacturers, IMRS was no different. You couldn't say things because they were afraid of the, the FDA, um, Paul Webb, Pulse Centers. Oh, my God, you can't say certain things. You know, uh, it's going to, um, you know, Pat and, uh, and Henry at uh, MagnaWave and Equipulse, they had no clue, but um, they, they didn't even want to learn. But the reason that they're interested in us saying things differently and, and is completely counter to what are, is our best interest and our, I'm meaning practitioners and the people that we treat, they're worried about the FDA coming down on them. Um, and the reality of it is, is that the FDA doesn't care at all about what we do, and they for sure do not care anything zero about horses. So you can say anything, you can do anything, you can, they even told us, that you can kill a horse, we don't care. Um, but a pe but people, they can complain and, and they can um, get people in trouble. But the people that will be in trouble are the manufacturers, and as a practitioner, our responsibility is really to 
do the best that we can for our clients and and um, both two-legged and four-legged and try to get the best job that we can. And so you, when you're listening to what people say you can and can't do, what you can and should do, you have to kind of take it with a grain of sand and say, where are you from? Um, the previous mindset was you couldn't use PMF in any one spot more than four minutes. And we have blown that just completely out the door. I mean, I, I did, uh, I did a ha an hour today and I typically will do 90 minute sessions and um, Christina, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can tell us how you really kind of took this and, um, and let the, the process evolve and, and to where you are now. So um, I'm getting yeah. off, my, I'm getting off my soapbox. I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, um, and I, I talked about all of this in the video as well, but um, I had never heard the four minute or the 10 minute rule. Um, I'd never heard of it. Um, everywhere from the moment that I heard about PMF until I started doing my own research, every research article, every like everything that people were talking about, and I'm talking about, you know, medical doctors and offices that were using PMF and physical therapists who have it in their facilities, the practicality of it is what they got down to was, you know, you have to do this for a minimum of six hours a day to see an impact. So I had no clue where four minutes came from. <laughs> um, and of and course that, that six hours that the, all the studies were really done using low intensity devices. Right. Yep, yeah, they were. And, um, you know, you can read the studies where you get into diathermy, which, you know, you're talking about radiation with electromagnetic field therapy. Um, and there, you know, you're very limited in what you can do. So we're in this, and we're in between all of that. And um, <laughs> uh, I, I had to do my homework. Um, and I talk about in the video, um, I was honestly very, very skeptical about PMF because I had heard about this, pra it not being practical. Um, and the lack of seeing results, um, the financial investment to, I mean, people can't make that kind of investment to do therapy for six hours a day, every day, especially on a horse. Um, and then talking about four minutes, when I started to hear about the four minutes and the 10 minutes, um, they weren't seeing results. And so why is somebody going to continue to pay for a therapy when they're not seeing any results? Um, and I, I walked away from it. I, I really shelved the idea of adding it to my practice and said, you know, this just doesn't make sense. I'm going to look at other things. I looked into functional electric stimulation, which is similar to a TENS unit, but um, muscle contraction, that didn't make sense to me. Um, I looked into laser, I was like, well, there's not really any more science there than there is on shockwave, so not really interested in that. Um, and it started to kind of tickle my brain a little bit, for lack of a better way, is, well, if it's so impractical, why is it being used? Talking about PMF, if it's not practical, why, why is it even out there? Um, so I took it upon myself to go on to PubMed, to go on to the NIH. Um, I've been a student forever, so I have access to a lot of that that doesn't cost me anything. You said N N NIH, what's NIH? Um, National Institute of Health. Um, okay. it's another and government pub, organization. PubMed is P pubmed.gov, which is yes. the, uh, governmental database for the all the studies. Yep, and yeah. PubMed is worldwide, where the NIH is really more U.S.-based. Um, you don't see a lot of articles that, unless somehow they've been shared with the U.S., you don't find them on there very easily. Um, but I started looking at it. Um, you, Being a student in the medical field and working in massage therapy, the school that I went to, is also a chiropractic college and um, one of the leading U.S. institutes on Chinese medicine. They are very, very, very strict on how we research. <laughs> so I learned how to do that very well and what I was looking for. 
and I went into looking at, you know, I wanted double blind, peer reviewed. I didn't want just case studies. And when I found something that was pertinent to what I was looking for, I would open up and sometimes purchase the entire clinical trial. Um, because all you see when you go on to those are the abstracts, you see the summaries, and it doesn't really provide you the information on, well, how long were they doing this? How often were they doing this? And um, how often were they measuring results? Um, and you had to really go in and read the entire um, publication in order to get a good idea of what they were doing. Um, so I did that. I did a lot of it. <laughs> Not many people do. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I am a, an admitted research junkie. I like doing it. I, um, I like knowing, well, what else is out there and how did they do this? Um, I enjoy it. Um, so it wasn't painful for me <laughs> uh, as it would be for someone else maybe, but um, it was very eye opening. And what I came across was in every single clinical trial, and they were using rabbits looking at non-union fractures. That was probably one of the biggest ones that I had come across where, mm -hmm. and it's probably one that everyone hopefully has seen. Um, but if you read the clinical trial on those non-union fractures, they're very specific that you do 30 minutes a, mi a minimum, and the frequency on how often you wanted to do PMF really depended on how rapid you wanted to see results. Mm -hmm. So you could do it more frequently and they, I mean, there were a lot of variables. So some of the research isn't quite as clean as, you know, saying, okay, well, we took these number of rabbits and did this every day for 30 minutes. We did these every other day. It doesn't go into that level of detail, although I'm sure that um, they do have that information somewhere. But um, going through what was published, it didn't provide that information. So it didn't tell you how often to do PMF, but it did very clearly say that you had to do this for a minimum of 30 minutes to see a lasting cellular charge um, where you are changing the cellular, um, the mag ma neg bleh, excuse me, the magnetic field of a cell um, required at least 30 minutes to have it last. And their definition of lasting, um, you know, was based on the healing of the of the bone in this particular study um, versus soft tissue. You know, it's a little bit different. Uh, so the more I read, the more I researched, the more I found that you needed 30 minutes at least. So I took the plunge. I bought my unit, and I was like, I mean, everyone around me. <laughs> My best friend is a physical therapist, and she's like, you just wasted your money because <laughs> she had known about this, and she was like, it's six hours a day. And I said, and I asked her, I said, um, she's a two-star rider. She rides eventing and at the two-star level, and I said, let me work on your horses. I'm not even going to charge you. I just want to – you're a skeptic. I'm a skeptic. Let's see if it makes a difference. And it completely made a difference. Um, yeah. And her – it's regular body work, but it took that body work to a whole nother level. I mean, mm -hmm. something that I couldn't do with my hands. Um, so she's a firm believer. I mean, she recommends it out to everyone now, and um, she's not an easy person to get to change her mind. Yeah, uh, when you're a really experienced massage therapist, um, you know, a, a body worker, you can really feel the difference in, in the muscles. Mm -hmm. And that's you know that's the, some of the the biggest skeptics turn into the biggest believers when they can actually feel the difference in the muscle. I remember one time I was working down in uh, in Wellington with a one of the probably the best uh, myofascia release guys, you know, and he was really he would reach up under the rib cage and grab a hold of the psoas muscle and then pull it. Myofascia release. If you're not familiar with it, they basically just pull on the muscle until and hold it there for like 30 seconds or more and then the muscle releases and when it releases it releases all kinds of uh you know i don't know what the, the physiological thing is but it's completely it completely frees up those muscles and uh, we start that's how i actually found out about the psoas muscle i'm like well, what are you doing that that and he's like oh that's the psoas muscle it doesn't you know brings the rear leg forward and all this stuff so we experimented and uh and I would treat treat the the psoas muscle prior to him doing it, 
And then he would get these like this immediate release. It's like, wow, look at that. It just released. And then we go to the other, go over to the other side and we go, okay, now we're not going to do that. And, and, and it would be completely different. And then he would get the release and then I would treat it. And then we would see what it was like after I treated it, after he did the release. And both ways, whether we did it before or after, it was, it was amazing. So people that use the muscles, they can really feel that. Yeah. So yeah, um, I mean, one, one thing I just want to say, make a real quick comment. Everybody seems to be having uh, problems. If you're seeing like a sticky picture on thing, it's either our internet or your internet. If everybody is seeing the same thing, um, Angela, it, you, you are getting, uh, it's probably yours. Um, we have some people saying that theirs is fine. And I know at our house, which is why I'm here freezing in Sam's house, our internet's terrible. So Sherry, Sherry's experiencing the the picture kind of freezing up. It's just the internet. It won't be like that when we do the playback. So, okay, yeah, everybody else is good. So I think it's just the individual internets are not. Uh, it takes a, it takes a big internet to pu push all this content through. So, anyway, um, sorry to interrupt you, Christina. Go ahead. And, no, that's and, fine. Um, so one of my um, one of my questions is that you know you you were telling me when we, when we were talking earlier about how you went from thirty minutes to sixty minutes to ninety minutes. You know, why don't you tell us about about that and why did you stop at ninety minutes? Is that like, and, I didn't actually. I mean, I tried longer, but um, I I was getting some calls um, from clients and. It, you know, to try PMF, and anytime somebody had a wound, I was like, "Pick me, pick me, I'll do it." <laughs> and uh, you know, I and mostly because I just wanted to see. But um, the open wounds are the easiest because we can physically see what's happening. We can see the changes in the tissue if it's underneath the skin and the coat. We have to have a vet do an ultrasound or some other type of imaging um, to see a difference. Um, and I'm not talking about what we feel, but just what we see. So looking at the open wounds, I was getting a lot of puncture wounds and a lot of, you know, lacerations. And um, so I started with that 30 minutes and the word minimum kind of kept coming to my mind. I was like, well, if they say minimum of 30 minutes, then why don't I try 45 minutes? And um, when I saw 30 minutes, I, you really didn't see a difference. You couldn't see something different from the moment you started to when you finished. Um, and at 45 minutes, I still couldn't see that either. And at 60 minutes, I could see a little bit of a change. You could see a little healthier pink around the tissue. Um, it so might be about while you're doing the treatment from beginning to end. Right. And I mean, if there's open wounds, um, I treat them with their when they're wrapped. Um, provided that they're in a place that can be wrapped. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, I just disinfect my equipment and um, before and after, and sometimes it gets gross, quite honestly. I mean, I've had some pretty nasty stuff on my on my coils, um, <laughs> but I clean them uh, very well, and um, I use some pretty significant disinfectants on them as well. Um, but I got to 60 minutes, oh, and yeah. you could see the margins around the wounds start to have a healthier oh. color. My dogs are trying to participate. I apologize. They're feeling ignored. <laughs> I, I think we're all dog people. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, so at 60 minutes, you could see a healthier pink margin, um, but it was minimal. Um, you, I had a little bit more serum and fluid oozing from wounds, you could see something was happening. Um, and that was pretty cool. But I mean, I had people willing to let me play with what I was doing. So I took advantage of that. And I bumped it, I went straight from 60 minutes to 90 minutes. And it was just a pure like, well, let's try this, you know, um, you get past 90 minutes, people don't really want to stand there and spend the time and the horses are antsy, they've kind of had enough. Um, but at 90 minutes, the changes in the tissue, you could see a physical difference in healthy margins, um, the serum that would, you know, be secreted from the open wounds, um, infections coming to the surface that it was, it was just pretty amazing. Um, proud flush, um, I had one, and this is one that I don't have, and um, 
before and after pictures of it, and I really wish that I did, but we could really, they took wet paper towels, the vet was present, and we wiped the proud flesh off. Like, it oh, just wow. wiped off. And it didn't all come off, but, I mean, it was coming off in chunks. It was disgusting and fascinating because <laughs> I like that stuff. Um, and so it was really, it was really fascinating. Um, I've not had that to where we could just wipe it off again. Um, but it was a game changer for how the vets viewed PMF in my area, especially that one in particular. Uh, but she was a huge advocate and went out and kind of was like, you guys got to try this. You need to have her come out and talk about it. You know, you need to do some research, understand this better. Um, and so having the vets around and then being willing to give something a try. Um, and as I shared in the video, I was the last resort. I mean, I was the person the vets were calling in or referring out when they were out of op options and ideas. Um, yeah. When these horses, some of them were very close to being euthanized and they just said, well, what's it gonna hurt to give her a shot, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, that's how I established the relationships with the vets was being the last resort, the, the last option, you know. Um, yeah, and that's, that's it's, it's an unfortunate thing, but it's, it's, it is kind of how everybody kind of gets their foot in the door and builds that relationship with the vets because they feel like, oh, well, they've got nothing to lose. And, and, uh, but when they do see a turnaround like that, you know, it's, it's usually a pretty substantial turnaround for them. Well, one of the really awesome things for me anyway is um, now I'm the first call. So the vet <laughs> will go out and have an issue. And I went from being the last resort to you should try this first. And that's amazing. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. It is. I mean, it keeps me busy. I mean, I could work seven days a week and 15 hours a day if I wanted to work that hard. <laughs> yeah. And you're not in a huge horse country you know i mean wisconsin you're wisconsin it's not like you're you know uh, california or wellington um yeah. and i'm i'm west central wisconsin northern wisconsin i'm right very close to the minnesota border and believe it or not we have more horses per capita between our two states than all of florida and kentucky yeah okay <laughs> all western i mean the majority of the clients are western based um and uh, that's not a discipline that, I mean, quite honestly, I don't get phone calls to work on Western, on horses that are in the Western disciplines. And um, it's because of my body work. Uh, and that's a whole nother topic for another day. <laughs> but, um, it, it's because of body work that, mm -hmm. that I don't get those calls. I'll get calls for them on wounds to do PMF specifically, but nothing hands on. Hmm. So. That's weird. Yeah, well, let's get this video going, and um, we're going to run over our uh, our one hour break, but that's okay. Um, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to have questions and answers. And um, well, let's see, where's the video thing? Um, so this video is about forty five minutes long, and um, hope everybody sticks through. I hope the uh, the internet holds up for everybody. I think people are having some some internet issues, but um, here is uh, here's Christina and her video. Hi, um, my name is Christina Cooper. I am a licensed massage therapist and an equine sports massage therapist, as well as PMF practitioner. I've been doing the work as a, an equine therapist for going on six years, I think. Maybe a little longer. Time flies. I'm not sure exactly. But um, John and Sherry invited me to come on and speak with everyone regarding wounds and PMF um, specifically. I have had a lot of success with wound care and PMF as well as establishing those relationships within the veterinary community and getting those referrals. So they had asked me to kind of chat with you a little bit about um, how that got started, uh, what my protocols are, and how I came about those protocols, um, when I use it, why I use it, and how I establish those relationships with the veterinarians. Um, so to start, the uh, 
backstory for me with PMF. I was, quite frankly, very skeptical about PMF. Uh, when I initially heard about it, I was reading some anecdotal research and listening to experts um, that had shared information with me stating that PMF was not effective unless it was used for six hours a day, every single day. So that's not even remotely practical. It's not financially feasible. It's not feasible for time. Um, nobody's going to be able to ever do that. It's just, it's not realistic. And so I kind of pushed it away and was like, well, that really stinks. Like, why would this therapy even exist if it was so impractical? Um, and after a little while, that thought stuck in my head, like, well, why would it exist if it, that was the case, if that was true, that you needed six hours a day every day to see results? So I personally started to dig into the research. I started with PubMed. I started with the NIH, and I started looking for research articles in regards to PMF, I was really looking for clinical trials. I was looking for peer-reviewed and double-blind uh, studies, um, as well as some well, well-documented case studies. Um, and I didn't just read the abstracts. Uh, I would find research that looked interesting, that would give me as much information, positive or negative, on the outcome of PMF. And what I found as I dug through and actually started reading these clinical trials is that in general, if you read through the trials, if you purchased the ability to read the entire trial and not just the abstract, you would find that what they were finding is that you needed a minimum of 30 minutes to have a lasting cellular change to the magnetic field of a cell. And they were doing this with histology, they were looking at it from bone density, um, soft tissue, um, looking at the lymphatic system, the increase in phagocytes in the blood um, and in the lymph system. Um, so they were really looking at like, how long do you have to do this? Um, it was, none of the articles were really specific in terms of intensity or frequency, uh, frequency as in the frequency of the pulse, not how often you do it. Um, they did go into how often they would perform PMF to see a result. So I started to take that research and go, maybe there's more to this than meets the eye, and maybe what I'm hearing out there in the world from every one of these experts who's telling me Maybe they don't really know. And um, so I did a little bit more digging. I spent about a year of research. I tried to find vets that were using it or were familiar with it, and that was really hard to come by. Um, very few vets knew about it. Um, and when they did, they really didn't understand it. And they weren't very open to it. They kind of thought that it was a fad. Um, that it was very similar to like a TheraPlate, like, well, it's not going to hurt anything, but mm, doesn't really have a benefit, not that we know of. And they were pretty just close-minded. Um, I don't want to say that they were against to it, against it, because they weren't saying, no, you can't do this, but they were definitely not on board with supporting it, more or less. So I... I took the plunge a little bit blindly. Um, I mean, I'd done all this research, but I was still like, I don't know. Um, and I bought a unit. I mean, I made a big investment. Um, I bought an EQX. Um, I'm glad that I bought that unit. It has served me very, very well. Uh, and this is a unit from Pulse Centers. Um, I went with Pulse Centers because of their technology. Um, it was superior to all of the other brands that I had researched. Their customer service and support for their product, um, it was just, it was beyond what other companies were offering. Um, their uh, wavelength um, and the frequency of pulse, all of that was superior. Their attachments. Um, so that's the unit that I went with. 
I got a unit and okay, now what? <laughs> uh, so what I did, um, I just started offering it to clients demos. Every time I went out to work on a horse for body work, I was like, you know, why don't we try this on your horse? And I was doing quite a bit of it for free initially. Um, I had massage appointments. I have a very established base of business with my massage clients. So I just said, you know, you want to give this a try. And um, I presented it more to them as a little bit of an experiment um, for about a month. And then I didn't. I was like, I'm charging for this service. I paid a lot of money for this. And people are seeing results and they're seeing a lasting benefit to their body work sessions. And I wasn't, of course, doing a whole lot, sorry, uh, doing a whole lot in regards to um, wound care because other than manual lymphatic drainage and, you know, working with horses with edema, um, from a soft tissue body work, manual hands-on perspective, that's what I was spending my time on. But I wasn't the person people called when their horse got a cut or severed a tendon, um, just wasn't me. So um, I got a phone call from a woman who I didn't know. Um, I had never worked on her horses before uh, and she didn't know me, I didn't know her, but we knew some mutual people. And they said that they had a horse with a severe knee injury. Um, she actually had multiple injuries, but um, she had gotten cast in a stall. Uh, she was in foal at the time, and um, she probably really should not have survived the injury initially. Uh, but they had opted to do everything they could for her to try to initially just save the foal. Like if they can keep the mare going long enough um, and comfortable enough where it wasn't unfair to her uh, so that she could at least have the foal. Um, it looked, uh, I'll share these photos and everything, but it looked as if the injury was um, healing. Uh, this is prior to them calling me in, prior to the vets involving me. Uh, it looked like the injury was healing. Um, externally, it had closed, um, and then it just <sighs> ruptured open. Um, lack of a better word, there was a massive amount of infection underneath the surface of the skin, and the tissue was not healing. It was mush. Um, very gross, um, very infected. Uh, this had gone down into the joint capsule. She had severed both of her extensor tendons on her right front leg, um, excuse me, left front, and um, it was bad. <laughs> I mean, she had severe injuries, and if it had just been an extensor tendon, it probably wouldn't have been so bad. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was the joint capsule as well. There was significant damage there. Um, the vets had done everything they could. Um, the mayor did have her foal. Uh, she did um, successfully deliver the foal and the foal was healthy, but uh, they were two months into this recovery and it just wasn't going the way that they thought. Um, so they had the newborn foal and they th said, you know, we've got to keep this mare alive. We have to get this foal on this mare um, for at least three months. That was the vet's goal. But they'd given up. They literally said, we are out of ideas. Um, you can continue to butte her. She was getting four grams of butte a day um, for two months already. So at risk of kidney problems um, for her and the foal, uh, as well as all other kinds of issues. Um, long story short, we'll go into the case study and I'll talk a little bit more about that specifically. But they called me in and they said, let's try PMF. And I got out there and I looked at it and I've worked with vets. So as a, I started working with veterinarians when I was 12. I worked for um, vets at Peterson and Smith down in Ocala, Florida, following them around basically kind of like a puppy. And then I worked with another um, vet who, any chance I got, I rode with him and worked as his assistant from the age of 12 until I was 18, um, down in Florida in Ocala as well. 
I've been around the block with wounds and seeing what was what, and I saw this knee, and I really didn't think there was much that I was going to be able to do, but hey, we have PMF, and you're willing to try it, so I'm willing to try it, and I thought, this is what they say it does. They say that it heals tissue and that it helps the body's own ability to heal itself. What better opportunity to show an example of that than, than this particular injury? So um, I sat down with the vets and we talked about it and they were kind of like, well, you can try it, but we don't know. And very just not opposed, but didn't think they would see much of a benefit. Um, and we pulsed it. Um, in the first session, which was 90 minutes, and I'll tell you how I came up with the 90 minutes, um, but we pulsed her for 90 minutes, and we pulsed over the bandage, and uh, I got to see it prior to the bandage, and then I got to see it when they removed the bandage after the session and changed it back out again. The difference in the tissue was really significant. Um, she had a lot of proud flesh. We wiped the proud flesh off with paper towels, wet, damp paper towels, um, scrubbed it. Uh, it was um, oozing and bleeding and infection was coming out of it and it smelled gross and it didn't look good, but there was activity and the tissue looked different. Um, it had nice pink edges like right away, like the margins around the wound had a healthy pink to them. So we decided that we were gonna pulse this horse um, every other day, which that's a lot. Um, I mean, that's a lot to ask of a practitioner to make the drive out to a barn for one horse every other day. And um, for however long that was gonna be, we had no idea. We didn't know what we were starting with. So we decided that we were gonna start with um, four sessions and after each four sessions, we were going to reevaluate. By the fourth session, the fourth 90 minute session, the wound was, I mean, you'll see the pictures. There's just no comparison to where it started. And it was healing from the inside out, not just covering the flesh on the outside and closing the wound inside. It was healing from the inside out. It took a lot of sessions. Um, I have it documented, uh, and I'll share that case study, but I cannot recall how many exactly. But it was a lot. Um, the mayor survived. Um, her injury healed completely. Um, the, there was no more infection. The soft tissue was completely healed. The bone was healed. Um, the injury itself looked amazing and it had healed. The vets were absolutely beside themselves. Like there is no way we've been trying for months to get this to heal and it hasn't healed. What are you doing? Tell me more about the PMF. So we talked about it and they started to kind of raise their eyebrows and go, well, maybe there is more to this. And so they would start giving me a call when they had um, smaller issues. Uh, you know, lacerations, um, puncture wounds, and say, try that PMF thing, see if that works. And what we were finding is, um, as I played with the time frames, um, which I started to do prior to getting called on this one mayor, um, I knew from my research that it required a minimum of 30 minutes to have a lasting cellular change. So I went to 60 minutes. Well, actually, first I went to 45. Um, and I was noticing a difference in the horses, um, smaller wounds, you know, healing a little bit faster, but you couldn't see a change. You couldn't tell that there was any kind of a difference. Um, but it did seem to reduce how much time uh, it took for those wounds to close. Um, so I played with it some more. Uh, I went from 45 minutes to 60 minutes. And okay, there's some good benefits there. And then I went from, I still just wasn't honestly satisfied. I thought, well, okay, if 60 minutes does this, what does 90 minutes do? So I tried 90 minutes. And that seemed to be with open wounds, with tendon tears, 
with ligaments hairs, the 90 minutes seemed to be the ticket. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a few vets be willing to work with me. Uh, it took a little convincing, um, and it was money out of the client's pocket as well. The clients had to be willing to have an ultrasound the day that I started and have an ultrasound again, you know, five sessions later. So there was a financial investment with the clients as well, um, but my clients trusted me, and we got to see some pretty amazing results. Um, it started to build some credibility with the veterinarians that uh, things were changing, tissue was healing faster. I have one case where um, I'll share some some images with you of a vertical vertical suspensory tear uh, that was about an inch long for a lesion, maybe an inch and a half. Um, and I want to say it was my, I think it was four to five centimeters. So it was, it was a good big lesion. Um, it wasn't very wide, but it was very long. And we took imaging on day one. Now this horse had had a suspensory ligament tear on another leg when I first got my unit, when I first got my machine, it was one of the first, very first horses I ever worked on. And they were doing shockwave. They were also lasering it. We added in PMF. So nobody really knows like what it was that helped this suspensory ligament heal as quickly as it did, but it healed pretty rapidly, and they were very pleased. Um, this time, they only did PMF on the other leg. Um, so they did the PMF on the new suspensory tear on the other leg, the one with the vertical tear, and we ultrasounded it on day one of PMF therapy. We did five 90-minute sessions, and at the fifth 90-minute session, at the end of that session, so we didn't even wait 24 hours or a week, at the end of that 90-minute session, the vet did another ultrasound. There was zero evidence, zero evidence of any kind of suspensory tear in that leg. Um, the vet had a hard time finding it. She couldn't remember, she thought she was on the wrong leg. She had to refer to her notes. Um, the fibers that had laid down had done so in such a way that there was not even evidence of scar tissue. I mean, <laughs> that was, it kind of blows your mind a little bit um, in five sessions. And so now fibers had healed uh, and the tissue looked fantastic. But realistically, if you understand how tissue works, and hopefully you guys are taking the time to learn what tissue is, what tissue is made of, what different types of tissue are made of, and um, whether they are supposed to be elastic or not, um, hopefully you know the difference between a ligament and a tendon and you know muscle tissue and connective tissue, and you understand what those properties are for elasticity um, what their job is. Um, you know, a ligament is a stabilizer. It goes bone to bone, and its job is to stabilize a joint. It's to limit movement, um, to prevent hyperextension or hypo, you know, I mean, its job is to, your kneecap would fall off without ligaments. Um, our kneecaps are, are held the way they are and have very, very little movement um, because of our ligaments, because of our ACL, our LCL, and our MCL, horses have same, similar ligaments, um, suspensory ligaments, it's a stabilizer. A tendon, on the other hand, is how muscle attaches to bone, and it should be pretty elastic. Um, it is part of the lever system of how we flex and, you know, how we extend. Um, are, you know, if the muscles didn't attach to the bone, they would just be muscles. It just, you know, they wouldn't move anything. Um, and so hopefully you guys are really spending some time to understand what tissue is, what it does, I mean, what different tissue's job is, and how it responds when it is damaged or injured, um, and actually how those injuries happen, like what kind of traumas cause a specific type of injury. Um, besides, you know, open wounds, lacerations, etc. cetera, um, the obvious. So uh, when you have an injury like a suspensory or, or a ligament, um, excuse me, a tendon tear, um, 
how do those occur? Why do they occur? I think that that's important to know. Um, and I personally learned that in school when I went uh, to school as a licensed massage therapist. Um, I have an associate's degree in massage therapy in therapeutic, orthopedic, and sports massage. Um, and it was probably one of the most beneficial things I ever did. I went and did that after I had started working on horses. And I just feel like now I actually know what I'm doing. Where before, it wasn't that I didn't know, because I knew all the movements that I was supposed to do, but I didn't know why I was doing it. Um, sure, I knew why. It would improve circulation, etc. But... I didn't know what exactly I was doing to affect the tissue. How was I affecting mobility? How was I affecting um, muscle fibers? How was I affecting the way that this tissue worked? PMF has the benefit of doing that because it's working on a cellular level. Um, think about this. So I'm going to sidetrack for a second. When you talk about PMF therapy with your clients, and they're like a little bit like, wow, it works on a cellular level. It's a great tagline. Um, but your clients don't understand what you're talking about. They don't know what that means. And here you are, you have to try to explain that to them. Um, if you have a cell that is dysfunctional, one cell, well, our bodies are made up of billions of cells. So big deal, one or two aren't working right. Okay, maybe 10 aren't working right. Maybe we're dehydrated. Okay, so a few cells aren't working right. If you throw a pebble into a pond, like a tiny little pebble, it could be as big as a grain of sand, it will create a ripple. And that ripple is going to affect everything around it. It's gonna spread out. Well, cells, are the basis of tissue. So you have cells and cell, a group of cells with a similar purpose and um, that all have the same job, form tissue. Uh, that tissue becomes an organ. <laughs> um, whether it's our skin or our heart or our lungs, you know, it's, it's got a job to do. So a group of tissues becomes an organ. Um, I won't get into, you know, going from like organisms to cells all the way up to, you know, um, a species, etc. But learn your tissues. Learn what tissue is. Learn the stages of that. Um, and know that if you have a cell that is not functioning properly, then you should be considering that that has a ripple effect. It may not be a noticeable one. Um, probably very rarely is actually. Um, but those are subclinical, meaning that it's not noticeable enough for you to call a vet. It's not noticeable enough for you to go, wow, there's something wrong. But when you get to a point where you're starting to notice some sort of resistance, um, movement dysfunction, um, behavior changes, the way that they stand, the way they want to carry themselves, all of those different things that as horsemen hopefully we're paying attention to um that ripple effect is is growing the ripples are getting bigger um and so consider that and it's a great way to kind of talk to your clients about using pmf um when it's appropriate uh and i there are times when it's not appropriate so keep that in mind too but um for the most part those are there's fewer instances where it's not appropriate than there are instances where um, you, than it is. I mean, you can use it for just about anything. Um, I hope I haven't gotten too far off track so far. I apologize. Um, so the how, I think I shared with you how I got to my protocol of 90 minutes and why I like to use that for injuries. Um, that that's kind of my standard um if a client can't afford 90 minutes i will do an hour um, but i really like the 90 minutes that's where i see results that's where i see a change um that's where my clients can go oh, wow you know and i'm not doing this for the wow factor but it definitely certainly validates you a little bit when your clients can take a wrap off and go is that for real like look at all that healthy tissue um 
So when are you going to use PMF with a wound or an injury? When there is no more active bleeding, period. As soon as there is no more active bleeding and that wound has clotted and it is stitched and bleeding is controlled, start pulsing it um, as soon as you can. <laughs> Uh, I have established relationships with some of the vets in the area that when they get severe injuries, they are calling me going, can you come by here on your way home today and pulse this injured horse? Um, they have called from everything from um, puncture wounds. Uh, I had a horse that got a stick through its head um, and they had not even extracted the stick yet and that stick was pretty long it was a good nine to twelve inches long i can't remember the exact measurement but it went all the way through and just was brutal looking um we pulsed it before we they extracted the stick um they then extracted the stick and put some drains and things in and we pulsed it while those drains were in uh, we didn't pulse right over it we pulsed all around it but not over that particular injury <coughs> so that's the other thing is like where do you pulse um, it kind of depends on the horse's tolerance and how severe the injuries are I have had two I have a local vet that I work with and I've had two cases at her clinic where she has sedated the horses so that they could be pulsed because they were in so much pain that we couldn't even get the coils on them um, we only had to sedate them the first two times and then they were fine and she was no longer having to butte them and couldn't believe that these horses were no longer on pain meds. Um, the tra transitions in healing tissue was just not what you would expect. It was really, really impressive. And these horses stayed at the clinic during their recovery. So the vet was monitoring and bandage changing every day uh, and was able to see those results and just kind of spread the word, quite honestly. She spread the word to her clients. She spread the word to other veterinarians. And um, she was sharing pictures and videos. And so some of the other vets that were skeptical had taken this and ran with it and said, well, if she's using it and seeing these results, let me just try it. Let's see. Um, so uh, the when. Um, there is the question if they're having other therapies done, whether it's functional electric stimulation, so FES, um, if they're doing um, shockwave, when would you do it? Do they have an injection? Um, when are you going to do that? Uh, my rule of thumb, and this is primarily coming from veterinarians and from anecdotal case studies, because there is, I have not personally found any research out there where um, there is really good science on pulsing after injections or after shockwave. I can tell you that the vets in our area are doing a lot less shockwave than they used to be, but they're, they're, there's definitely times when shockwave is a really great therapy. Um, but they're turning to PMF, they're calling me more. Uh, I asked the vet recently um, why they didn't just buy a machine for their clinic, and their response was, it's not cost effective for us to pay an employee to go out and do this. And it's not cost effective for the vet to go out there and do this and spend, you know, um, 90 minutes plus travel time to go out and treat one horse for $150 or whatever it is that you charge. So that uh, made me feel pretty good. They're not going to go out and buy equipment and try to start offering this therapy. It doesn't make sense for them. It's not cost effective. They can do shockwave in five minutes and charge $300 to $400 a session. Um, PMF, not the most cost effective thing for a veterinarian to do, but it's definitely cost effective for you to do um, if you have your vets on board and you, they've established trust with you and can establish um, a really good clientele and referral business from that. Um, so why are you going to do PMF on wounds? Um, because it accelerates the healing of wounds. Um, 
it's not just open wounds. It's it's the internal damage as well. Um, I'm a skeptic. You know, I, I'm a massage therapist. I know what my hands can do to tissue. I know the changes that my hands do to tissue. I cannot change the magnetic field of our cellular structure. I cannot do that with my hands. Um, a, if you understand, again, working on understanding tissue and cells and cellular structure, we've heard the taglines about, you know, um, cell membranes and how PMF opens up cell membranes so that oxygen can get in and nutrients can get in and waste products can get out. Uh, but what we don't understand and is, and, or maybe you do, I don't know, but our bodies, every process that our bodies do, every single process, whether it's chemical, electrical, magnetic, every single process that we do requires a foundation of certain things to take place. Um, and if you break all of it down to the smallest of processes, you're looking at molecular processes, um, protons and neutrons and ele you know um, electrons all have to interact and work together. Uh, my dog here is going to join us and say hello. Um, <laughs> and um, but they those processes have to take place. Going off on another little tangent here. Uh, we've all heard about antioxidants. We take antioxidants. There's free radicals out there everywhere. Absolutely right. But do you understand what a free radical is, what it's doing? And let's say that you have a molecule, an atom, that you know hasn't become a compound yet. It hasn't found what it's trying to attach to. H2O. You have oxygen. You have hy hydrogen. And those two are supposed to connect. If your hydrogen gets a free radical, meaning another little proton attaches to that hydrogen atom, that hydrogen atom cannot attach to that oxygen atom. So they have to, you have to fix that. You have to fix those free radicals. Your body has to get rid of them. PMF helps with that. It helps rebalance the electromagnetic field of the body. It helps rebalance protons, neutrons, and electrons and how they interact with each other. It helps the body get rid of that oxidative stress that causes free radicals. Um, so if you've ever had a horse like pee or they poop after you work on them and it reeks, it just stinks. Um, sure, it's toxins and the horse is detoxing. Not, I mean, it's an easy way to explain it, but that's not really what's happening. What's really happening is the body is getting rid of oxidative stress. The body is now able to eliminate waste products that it was holding on to that was causing damage to the to, to the tissue, to the cells. Um, so whether you have a wound or not, if you have an injury or not, and you're pulsing these horses, um, keep pulsing, uh, you know, you are making a change. You are helping the body uh, with oxidative stress, which is damaging to our tissue. It is damaging to our cells. It slows down the electrical and chemical processes that our body requires to be healthy. Uh, so PMF enhances that. It's restorative. Um, we have to be careful about what words we say. You know, they say don't use the word protocol. They say don't use the word um, that it heals. Um, I'm not saying that, but it does enhance what the body's already trying to do. It stimulates processes that are stagnant. Um, when it comes to, you know, wounds, one of the things that is so in interesting and kind of just wonderful from my perspective is when working with open wounds with the vets, you can physically see the difference. It's not abstract. It's not something that you're guessing on or you can't say this is a placebo effect. Um, you can't say it's not helping. Um, it, you can see, you literally see the difference. Uh, you can see the changes. For me, that number is 90 minutes. Um, I try. I went up to two hours, just so you know. Um, I tried going all the way up to two hours, and I didn't notice the difference between 90 minutes and two hours. Um, 
I notice the difference the most at 90 minutes. Personally, I sleep on my PMF pad, uh, and I'll do it all day long when I have nothing else to do, or if I don't feel well, I will pulse myself uh, ongoing. <laughs> um, and I do notice the difference uh, in my own body. Uh, and if there was some kind of anti-aging property with antioxidants and free radicals and everything, I would probably pulse myself every single day. But so far, I haven't found that. Um, <laughs> but um, I do believe that it exists, though. I'm just not the guinea pig to try it on. <laughs> um, I have some photos. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get these shared to all of you. I was trying to do it here in the video, but um, it won't allow me to share them like this and I don't have the ability to print them. So what I'm going to do is send a file over to John and Sherry and you can request it or they'll share it to you. Um, and it'll have photos in there. It'll have a case summary of what I did, why I did it, when I did it, um, how we, I was working with the vets. Uh, it, it will be summaries on a couple of different cases and um, you'll get to see you know, how those wounds treatments and what I was doing um, was working with those horses. Um, I have a personal story to share with you as well um, in regards to PMF and nerve regeneration. I have scoliosis. I have pretty severe scoliosis. I ride horses. I try to be an athlete. Uh, I try to take pretty good care of myself, but um, Four years ago, or five years ago now, um, in 2013, six years ago, um, I herniated all of the discs in my lumbar vertebrae, every single one of them. Um, they were severe herniations. I um, had muscle spasms that paralyzed me. I couldn't move at all. I had to be hauled out of my house in an ambulance on some kind of like weird stretcher thing, not just a regular stretcher, but some weird, bizarre thing and went to the hospital. I was on an absolute ton of morphine and Valium and anti-inflammatories. Um, I didn't know if I was going to walk again. Um, that was six years ago. It was um, about five months after I started doing body work on horses, actually. Uh, scary. I mean, it was terrifying. Um, I lost a month of my life uh, because I was so medicated I don't remember anything, I mean anything at all. My husband had to take off of work and take care of me. Um, I couldn't get up or get down, I couldn't move without assistance. Um, I couldn't even sit up. Um, I couldn't do anything without assistance. It was brutal. And I was not a surgical candidate. They couldn't do surgery for me. Um, we didn't know what I was going to do. So they prescribed, um, sent me to a pain doc, and they decided to give me a whole bunch of drugs. Um, I was going to live on uh, Flexerol, which is a muscle relaxer, Ciflexin. I was going to live on Tramadol, uh, a pain pill, a class 2 pain pill, uh, narcotic. And I was going to live on 1,000 milligrams twice a day of ibuprofen. It was an anti-inflammatory. Um, they also wanted to try me on gabapentin, um, which I said no, because um, I had seen and experienced those effects before. But I didn't want to be a zombie. I don't function well on narcotics. I don't function well on muscle relaxers. But I had to move. I had to do something. So I took those drugs for two years. And um, I also went in and got a procedure done um, every eight months called radiofrequency ablation, where they go into your facet joints, so sensory nerves, not motor nerves, and um, they burn the nerve endings of your sensory nerves in your facet joints. And they did this all the way down my lumbar vertebrae on both sides so that I would not feel pain, and but I could still move. Um, that was great. Uh, I didn't feel pain, but my body still didn't move properly. I just didn't feel the pain, um, but it didn't change how I could move. I still could not stand upright. I could not stand up straight. I couldn't sit and tuck my tail 
tailbone. I couldn't, I couldn't ride uh, because I couldn't sit on my seat bones. I couldn't even find it. I couldn't engage my core. Um, I literally could not stand up straight. It was awful. Uh, so I had that done three times, radio frequency ablation done. Um, after the third time that I had it done, I um, owned my PF machine. I had just gotten it, as a matter of fact, about a month after I had uh, had my last radio frequency ablation done. Um, I had a rough day at work. I was working on a lot of horses, and I was really sore, and I was kind of panicking that um, although I didn't have all the pain, I thought maybe I might have some muscle spasms, and that could send me to the hospital again. I didn't want to do that. My brother is a chiropractor down in Tennessee, and he owns four um, pulse centers beds, uh, PMF beds. And um, he said, why don't you just use your PMF on yourself? Duh. I mean, I'd had the unit for only a couple of weeks, and I didn't have any idea what I was doing. But I looked up some research, and I talked to him, and I talked to his physical therapist that works in his clinic. and. Um, decided that I was going to wrap my large equine coils around my hips and my waist and watch TV. And I did for three hours. I pulsed my back for three hours. Two days later, I couldn't move. I literally was right back where I started. Um, I didn't have the muscle spasms. I wasn't paralyzed from inflammation and muscle spasms, but the pain was so intense that I couldn't move. Um, I called my pain doc and I was like, I don't know what happened. This isn't possible. I just had radio frequency ablation done. How could I possibly be in this much pain? And he said, well, I don't know. Um, and he said, you know, there's really, you know, nothing regenerates nerves that fast, you know, ha ha ha, maybe some, you know, pulse electromagnetic field therapy. And I went, oh my God, I did that. And I said, yeah, I did do that. And he goes, what do you mean you did that? And I said, I own a machine. He goes, no, you don't. You know, people don't just own those machines. You have to go to a clinic for that. And I said, no, I work on horses, and I own a PMF machine, and I did PMF on my back. I wrapped myself in my equine coils and pulsed my back for three hours. And um, he basically said, congratulations. You just wasted $10,000 on PMF uh, because you've probably just regenerated all of your nerve endings. Um, okay, so now what do I do? <laughs> and he said, well, um, you can come back in, but you'll have to pay out of pocket for another procedure because insurance isn't going to cover it. But I would really just suggest that you continue to do PMF therapy. Well, why didn't you tell me this two and a half years ago? They didn't tell me this. and that It wasn't even an option. They didn't, they didn't tell me I could do this. So I did. I took a week off. I canceled all my clients for a week. I pulsed myself every day for a week, and I just did an hour a day. Um, and you know that I take no meds. Um, I've owned my machine now for about three years. I do not take any drugs whatsoever. I am not on Flexeril. I am not on uh, ibuprofen. I am not on tramadol. I don't take any medications for my back. I ride four days a week, roughly. I try to ride that much. Um, I bike, I uh, swim, um, I lift weights, and I work. I work on horses. I do body work on horses all day long, six to seven days a week, and I have no pain, none. So if there is anyone out there who can ever say that PMF does not work, I am a walking, living proof that it works. I'm walking, living proof that maybe it doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. Is it going to work for every single case out there? Is it going to heal every wound you come across? Is it going to help heal? Um, is it going to accelerate the healing of every suspensory tear or every deep digital tear or every puncture wound or open wound? No, it's not. Um, but it will help. You know, I have zero doubt at all that it will help. Um, I think that people's expectations may need to be adjusted. Uh, I don't believe that PMF is a miracle. Um, I think that we don't know what all is going on within the body. We don't know what other kinds of dysfunction um, 
we don't know, you know, how damaged that body is um, overall, like how healthy it is. Um, I think we have good ideas when we can look at, you know, what a hair coat looks like and we know what that means. When we can feel tissue and know what tissue, healthy tissue feels like versus unhealthy tissue, uh, we have a pretty good idea of whether there's systemic problems and systemic, if you don't know what that means, it's internal. It means that it's a body-wide, a system issue. Um, like a virus or uh, bacterial infection within the body, um, uh, respiratory infections, whatever. Um, it's it, it's not a wound or a trauma or an injury. It's an illness. Um, we don't always know. And so um, we don't know how taxed that body already was. And cells have a pre-programmed lifespan. Um, some cells live for minutes, some live forever, um, and some live, you know, regenerate every few days. We get new cells. Um, our blood supply replaces itself really frequently. Um, so there is a lifespan to cells, and PMF um, can help, and then just general aging. You know, um, I don't, we can't reverse the aging process. Um, I do think, uh, personally, I can't say this with uh, any certainty, there's no science behind this that I could find, but I do think that it, you know, can probably slow the aging process down a bit for whatever your pre programmed destiny might be. Um, you know, maybe you'll be healthier until that moment. Um, that's my two cents. Um, that's my thoughts on wounds. Um, that's my thoughts on PMF therapy. I love this therapy. I would, I, I would not want to never have this in my practice. Um, it doesn't matter what I ever do with my future. PMF will be a part of it. Um, I'll be a part of the Q&A, so you guys will get to ask questions and, you know, um, hopefully I can answer them um, based on my experience and what I've researched. I'll share as much as I can in writing as well that uh, John and Sherry can um, share with you and uh, I look forward to it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. All right. That was amazing. Wow. <laughs> uh, don't even I don't know about everybody. <laughs> I don't know about everybody else, but um, I've got maybe ten thousand hours of PMF, you know, between the three of us. And uh, my wife is one of the most dedicated researchers on PMF ever, and I learned a ton. So I have to say thank you so much, Christine. I mean, that was just amazing. That was just amazing. You gave you took us right up to the leading edge, and uh, you know, <laughs> just, just amazing. And I and I love your testimonial. You know, I, I had a thirty year back problem, and uh, I'm I turned sixty this year, and I'm completely out of pain. And so I I, I know what you're saying. I wasn't in severe pain like you, but um, I, I also have a personal testimonial that has kept me in this this crazy thing. And um, so I uh, really appreciate you sharing that with everybody because everybody, when you go out and are talking to customers, there's no better thing to say than, uh, you know, than, than stories and testimonials. And when vets or doctors or whatever says, oh, there's nothing that will regenerate a nerve, you can say, oh, actually, I know this person that, you know, had, had a, a very, very real case that I talked to firsthand. And so <clears throat> I guess to say that yeah, was. They're uh, welcome to use the story if they want to. So. That, that, that's great. Yeah. And, and I definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as the, uh, all the documentation and stuff, everything that you give me, we will put on, put in the portal. Oh, it will perfect. be all go go underneath the the video that we have here, and underneath your video, you're, you'll we'll put your video um, by itself, but also in the context of this whole conversation, and then everything else will go underneath it. All the documentation and everything, and we'll go into that. So, and this portal will be available for everybody, you know, as as long as as long as we're around. So, um, anybody have some questions? Let's see. 
And normally we take a break at at at, uh, at an hour, but we're at 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 eight thirty right, eight twenty five right now. I say we just, uh, as long as it's okay with everybody, we just uh, power through for the next half hour and see what what questions there are and see what we can uh, if there's anything else we can do. Um, I have Renee saying, "Can you come to Asheville and, and do a few days seminar?" Yeah, I, you know. <laughs> That's a, a great idea. You know, um, that's one of the things that was so awesome about our jumpstart was that we get to sit around and talk about this stuff. And uh, there really is no better way to learn than when you're doing that. Um, yeah, Sherry just said something. Maybe we need to do it. Need to do another jumpstart. Um, but I would um, be. <laughs> yeah, I will definitely have you as the as a, a lead speaker. Um, the one thing that I a couple of points that I wanted to touch on was um, you mentioned the, this whole thing about the vets and how they don't want, it's not in their cost structure to be able to sit in front of a horse. And, you know, I, I've said that now for years and years as, as uh, all the manufacturers say, we got to be selling more vets. Like they just don't want to do this. Um, you will always find that in the beginning, I, I mean, your situation is not, uncommon probably very typical in that they always start out being skeptical mm -hmm. and then they see the evidence and then they start becoming um, believers and then they become lead sources you can't go to them and, and expect them to be lead sources because in a, in a way you are kind of competition but there is also the 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 um the great point that you brought up that they will quickly realize that really we're not. We're working on the same team, and what you do is not, they really can't be doing that. And they just have such an overhead, they can't afford to be doing that. <clears throat> Where for us, we don't have, you know, all the, the um, overhead. So right. um, that's, that is a, you know, a big uh, point that, it's really kind of hard to deal with vets in the beginning until you really understand where they're coming from. So I you get an amazing job. You know, um, I actually send a lot of my clients to the vet. You know, um, they'll try to call me and say, oh, hey, you know, I've got this situation, and um, can you come out and do some body work on it, do some PMF on it? And if I get out there and, you know, I – I have a little bit of an assessment process that I go through when I have a new client. If that horse is lame, if there is something significantly wrong with it, I mean, I run my hands over it. I try to feel what's going on. Um, but I'm usually like, you know, get your vet on board here and at least have an exam uh, so we kind of know what we're dealing with. Um, and, you know, I mean, the mystery lameness is where the vets are clueless and all of that. Those are really fun <laughs> but uh, because, you know, it doesn't matter where we put the coils. You know, if, if you're working the whole body, you're getting a benefit. Um, but when there's injuries involved, I, I refer the clients. And a lot of my clients don't even want to have their vet out. Um, I have I one that I just recently completed. Um, it's a regular client uh, for a little another little case study that fractured its tibia, and it was a beautiful clean break as far as fractures go. Um, but um, it was you know it was a significant fracture, and he was non weight bearing and wouldn't eat. Uh, they didn't know it was fractured, so they called me and asked me to come out and pulse him. That he hurt his leg. It was a right hind. Uh, this is an older horse. He's a thoroughbred cross. His um, used to be venting. Very hard keeper. I mean, this horse has a hard time keeping weight on everything. And they called me first before they called their vet. And I, I before I even went out there, I said, "This sounds pretty significant." You know, with what you're describing, you need to have your vet come out. You know, I, I appreciate that you're calling me, but have your vet come out. So they asked me if I would meet them there when the vet was coming, which I did. And they x-rayed and found this fracture. And the vets were like, we don't want you pulsing this. And I said, are you asking me to not pulse the fracture or not pulse the horse? And they said, don't pulse the fracture. I said, all right, if that's what you want, no problem. 
and I didn't. I stayed, and uh, quite honestly, you couldn't have gotten the coils around that horse's leg anyway without getting hurt. He just wouldn't let you touch it. But he wouldn't eat. He had gone three days without eating and barely drinking any water, and he he had dropped in three days. Pilot dropped close to 150 pounds. He was really showing his ribs and everything. Um, by the time I finished the first session, which the vets chose to stay around for, they were kind of interested in what I was doing. Um, the horse was wanting his food, and he's never been a horse that had a desire to eat. He was never an aggressive eater. Uh, he is now. <laughs> and um, But that first session, this horse that they were thinking you know, might not make it out of this because of his age and how hard of a keeper he was, um, had such a huge turnaround that midway through his um, recovery, they were telling them, stop feeding him so much. He's putting on too much weight. And this is a horse that was never doing that. But we pulsed him, I pulsed him, and just the body, I didn't even pulse his leg. I did pulse over his hips, it was a hind, right hind. But I pulsed his whole body, um, the trunk of his body and his neck and over his hips, but didn't go down around the hock at all. Uh, we did eight sessions over 10 days. It was 50% fused by the time they re-x-rayed it after two weeks. 18 days, they re-x-rayed it, and it was 50% fused. Um, completely fused at a month, uh, but they still made him stay on stall rest for, you know, um, for two months. So. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah. And, um, yeah, so many good points in, in that, uh, that, that case study. Um, one of them is that you really want to work with your vets and that if they understand it's a two-way street and, uh, you know, the respect goes both ways, then, then it really is a win-win for everybody. Um, but the other, the other part of that is that you don't really even have to get right on the break, it, that the, treating the whole body. This is why we're, um, you know, such believers in treating the full body, even if they have uh, an injury in the leg. It just accelerates the the um, the the, the um, healing process and stimulates the immune system. And so um, Samantha was, was um, had her, gelded her stallion and, and uh, she was pulsing him not anywhere near where he was gelded. And, uh, and this was after like, I don't know, it would, it was pretty well healed up. And then, and as she's pulsing his body, he started bleeding again. And it, and it just like, like, yeah, it just, uh, it really, when you're pulsing a, a horse, you really are doing the whole body. And uh, your, your extensive explanation and knowledge about tissue and ligaments and, and muscles and everything um, was really fantastic. And one of the things that I've always done is just been really curious about the, the body and, um, you know, how everything works and everything. I don't get as technical as you have, um, but the, well, it's, it's good. You know what you can absorb, you can absorb. And, uh, but one thing that I did kind of the foundation for the full body protocol was this um, fabulous work that uh, a lady, uh, I think her name is Gillian Higgins, out of uh, England, does her, her name of her business is Horses Inside Out. And what she does is she paints on the um, bones and muscles onto the horse and does demonstrations. And, uh, and I got my hands on her whole library of blogs and everything and pulled out the ones that I thought were, were the best. And I put those on the portal. And uh, so for everybody, I wanted to mention that. But it, she has a great article that goes along with the, uh, the anatomy diagrams or pictures that I put on the back side of the treatment sheet. And she talks about the three different types of muscles and mm -hmm. the superficial and, and uh, you know, the, the deep muscles. And um, it's a much more... Um, you know, easy to read layman's terms um, for people like me that, that need to keep it somewhat simple. Um, but that kind of understanding, the more that you can get 
uh, into the, the physiology and then the um, anatomy and really get an understanding of what it is under the skin that you are treating, it really does help you. And uh, if you want to earn more, you got to learn more. That's always been one of my big things. And, um, and uh, you did an amazing job at really bringing the level of knowledge up significantly in our little group here. And, you know, and, and like you talk about the ripple effect in cells, I believe there's a ripple effect in learning too. And as you throw the pebble of, into the pond of, of knowledge, it, it ripples out into the rest of the world. And, and you know, in this information, you know, will be taken out and more and more people will be able to get benefit from it even from this little group. So um, I really appreciate that. So any more questions that we have? Um, I'm surprised there aren't a lot more questions. Um, your, your thing was so, so thorough. Um, if you've got some questions, go ahead and get them up there. Uh, let's see. Elizabeth wants to ask, I want to know, I want to ask, how long do you wait after injections, do you pulse? Uh, I usually wait um, a week. I... I don't like doing that, to be honest with you. Um, my thought process is more along the lines of the client spent quite a bit of money to have the injection done. And um, because the body recognizes it as a foreign substance, don't want to stop that process that they've just paid for. Uh, on my own horses that I have had to have injections done on, um, I usually pulse them the next day. As soon as the anesthesia is no longer in their system, I pulse the next day. Uh, on a client's horse, I'm more cautious, um, and that really is just because they just spent a ton of money and they want to see if it makes a difference for them. And, you know, you have that 7 to 10 day rule or 10 to 14 days, depending on what your vet says. Um, back injections can take up to 30. I'm not going to wait 30 days to pulse the horse's back that had to get an injection. Um, I've got one to do tomorrow, actually, uh, possibly. Um, I think we're going to cancel that because of our weather here. but. Um, so I'm cautious with my clients' horses, but with my own, I would post as soon as their anesthesia has worn off if they've had to be sedated. That's great. Yeah, we're kind of the same way. Um, uh, Renee asks, how long did it take uh, to heal the nerves in your back? Um, I pulsed for three hours, and 48 hours later, they were <laughs> they were back. Um, so somewhere between that time frame. Um, and then how long before you started getting relief from your – I remember when that happened, by the way. Yeah, they yeah. were like, oh, my God, my, my back has gone back out. Like, Yeah, I can't move. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long before you started really feeling permanent relief? Um, about a week. A week, about a week uh, doing an hour a day. And um, once I got to that permanent relief where I just wasn't feeling pain anymore, my clients noticed. I mean, when I was stretching a horse or working on a horse's legs, they were like, wow, you know, you're not holding on to the horse to get back up again. You, you're squatting on your own. I was like, oh, <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> you can move. And um, so it was about a week of, you know, being consistent with doing an hour a day on myself, um, hour and a half, uh, you know, so anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes, depending on, you know, how much time I had. And uh, after that, you know, I was able to, I, I just, I maintain now. Um, I'm going to pulse tonight, but mostly because I'm so cold, my body hurts from the temperatures outside. <laughs> How much do you pulse, uh, you know, on a, on a weekly basis? What 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 is your what is your uh, regimen for yourself? For myself, um, I probably pulse once a week, um, and I usually do like I won't sit in my chair, um, which is silly because I have it sitting right here. But I tend to use my paddles a lot, and um, I pulse my right shoulder. Uh, I have a very old injury from riding on my right shoulder, and my right arm will get very sore. Um, so that, um, I'm, that's probably the biggest thing that I have to maintain. Um, the rest of my body feels amazing. Um, but once a month I'll sleep on my PMF chair pad. I'll just sleep on it and let it run all night. <laughs> and then, uh, but weekly I do my shoulder, um, every week. I do, um, 
you know, I, I do a couple of times a week and I'll do 60 to 90 minutes per, per session. I'll just mm -hmm. sit in the chair and turn it on. And uh, one of the things that I did is, is that I did pull the, um, I found the um, videos of the frequencies for um, off the pro. So I have the video, the frequencies. So if you have an, an EQX or you have the, the, the dial, the spark gap chamber um, versions, um, you can set the frequencies based by harmonizing to the video. So you listen to the video as it's going, as it's ticking at three beats per second and you just harmonize it. So you get three beats per second or 7.8 beats per second. But I've, done um, a lot of uh, fooling around with trying to trying to and, and research on octaves and uh, if you're a music person the, and I'm not but um, I understand octaves to be like half of frequencies and, and double frequencies and um, I believe there is something to that I don't know of any research that's ever been done on it but I've noticed a tremendous benefit by when I'm pulsing for myself uh, for a, uh, a longer period of time, like 60 to 90 minutes in, in, in a day, I will start out either at up high, like 7.8 beats per second, and then I go and cut that in half to four, and then I cut that in half to two. Of course, we have a pro, so it makes it a lot easier, but you can do it the same with an EQX. Um, and then, and then I go from from two to three to six point five, and then back up to nine, and I'll do that for ten twenty minutes each time. And by the time I get done, I feel fantastic. And I think that there is um, Paul Webb does the exact same thing. We was doing the same thing. We kind of compared notes, and um, Samantha started doing that too. Is like you do this broad spectrum of frequencies mm -hmm. and over your full body and I'm telling you it makes you feel amazing it is really I think I think that is the key to anti-aging um, I'm not really I don't really know what's going on in physiology but I know what's going on with my body and my body is you know it, it does not hurt um, my, the dog, my the dog here, I'm too. <laughs> yeah, she's, she actually keeps going. She had a uh, cruciate ligament tear, and I opted not to do surgery, um, and we just pulsed her. So my machine is sitting here next to me, and she keeps looking at it. She keeps going over there and sniffing it, and like, well, why are we using this right now? Can you turn that on? Yeah, turn it on for a while. <laughs> and she's a bit of a nudge, but um, I haven't tried. I mean, I always adjust frequencies, but I haven't done that um, to that level. That would be interesting to try. Yeah, if you're just if you're doing it for, of course, the different frequencies are um, seven point eight is for nerves, um, mm -hmm. six point five kills disease. So if you have a cold or you have any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of uh, sickness in your body, six point five just eradicates that. There was a study done by Pulse Centers for Old Dominion University that they did not release for fear that the, the FDA would come down on them, but they had absolute clinical um, uh, verification of that that showed uh, uh, um, infection going away with 30 minutes of 6.5. And, and, wow. and there was noticeable after 15 minutes, after 30 minutes, it was significant. So if you're feeling bad, 6.5, 5.0 is as high as you can go for bone and for muscle, tendon, ligaments. Um, and then the slower it goes, the more powerful it goes, the better it is for releasing inflammation because you're pulling out that, that inflammation. You're opening up those cells longer and letting the inflammation out. So those are like the, the kind of the benchmark frequencies for my have been my experience and and uh, that we've always used and believed in so the and and it was funny because we had uh and when we were down in wellington florida i had uh, a conversation by this lady 
who um, owns VetCure uh, Supplements. She is probably one of the world's foremost authorities on um, turning plant plants into uh, supplements. And her name is escapes me right now. Maybe uh, Sherry will will put it up there and and with their website. Um, but this lady had the most incredible mind. She had. Um, I think it was like idyllic or, or something, a, a mind that was, you know, beyond the photographic memory. Um, but she started quizzing me when we were in our tent in Wellington, Florida, about PMF and the different frequencies and everything. And she said that um, she totally confirmed what I just said, that 7.8 is for nerves and that closely resembles the earth. You know, you always try, I always try to look, for how things correspond into nature to look for confirmation. And if you look at the frequencies of a plant, the frequencies of a plant, the roots are a freak, have a frequency of 7.8. As you go up into the limbs of a tree, and, and uh, then it goes down into the threes and fives, which is exactly the same way as it is with the human body. Um, so um, as it is in nature, it also is in, in us. And um, the other thing that is a, an amazing story, just a, a real quick side story on this, the, what, what I'm talking about her, is that she said, so every, I, don't, I think everybody has seen the um, blood samples when you're pulsing about how blood goes from being, you know, all stuck together and, and, and that what's it called, relu or whatever, where the blood cells are all stuck together and then you pulse them and after 15 minutes they turn nice and round and all the blood cells are nice and full of oxygen and, and all are not sticking together and flowing and everything. She did studies in Italy with one of the foremost cancer uh, doctors. It's, it was actually the clinic that people send cancer cells to to be worldwide there's a one place in Italy that they send cancer cells to to get confirmation that it is a cancer cell. So she worked with these people, th this doctor in there, and they did studies based on uh, blood samples on positive thought and found that positive thought created the same effect on your blood cells and, and, and conversely as negative cell, negative thought did. So negative thought created the cells back into, they were all stuck together and everything. Positive thought and prayer gave the cells the same effect that PMF does. And they did this, they did this actually, you know, on, under the microscope, she had microscopic samples and they, she even did like demonstrations where people would come in and get their blood tested and okay, you know, think something really, really bad, you know, and they can take your blood cell, tell, tell, now think of something, you know, really, really good and, and meditate on it for a little while and then take another blood sample and they look at the difference under the microscopes. Um, so I can believe it. Energy is just absolutely amazing. I mean, anyone who's kind of familiar with applied kinesiology and how we can turn muscles on and off and it's just it blows my mind. Yeah, there's a, another great study that is also with water um, I can never remember the guy's name, and Sherry will probably put it up if she's um, if she's doing it. Uh, but he did the study as far as water, and they they um, thought really negative thoughts about a water and put it under a microscope. It had you know horrible shapes and figures, and then and then they uh, sent it love and um, and positive thoughts, and they and they showed the um, the, the the water crystals. Oh, my battery is running low. I talked my battery low. Um, the, the look like beautiful uh, snowflakes and beautiful designs of um, of the uh, uh, the shapes of the water. Hold on, right one second. Okay. All right, I'm back. Oh, yep. Ms. Sherry said, Dr. Amoto. 
Yeah, you can look that up. Uh, and Angela is also is a Dr. Moto. Um, you can look that up. But uh, so it's the same thing going on in your body and uh, yeah, all the the other um, evidence that um, what you're thinking in your going on in your brain is also f- affecting your whole body. So. Um, Anybody else? Um, oh, yeah, Angela says she's been playing with octaves um, since they talked and, and also likes it, yeah. So um, let's just check and see if there's any more. Christina, I think I got you all talked out. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, well, this has just been, I, I think, really a phenomenal uh, sort of an impromptu session, um, really had not intended on this when we first started. But that's kind of the, the um, beauty of, of keeping things a little bit open, that uh, when we see an opportunity to bring somebody like you in here and, um, you know, spread the knowledge that you've got, um, we really try to always take advantage of that. And so I really want to thank you for everybody uh, for sharing and being so open and uh, honest and um, having that thirst for knowledge that really keeps things moving forward, you know, without people like you. Um, Sherry always tells this story that that there is uh, like nine out of ten people when they come up to a locked door, when they, they want to get into a house and they go up to the front door and the front door is locked, they go, well, it's locked. I guess I can't get in. You know, one out of ten people go, hey, I wonder if the back door is open, you know. And, uh, you know, I think we have a room full of, of those one out of ten people. And then there's a small fraction of the people when the back door is locked, they go, hey, I wonder if that window is open. And they... Just keep looking for that crack to get into that house. And then you know what? If you just keep looking, somehow, some way, the door opens. And uh, Christina, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, I hope you all have uh, appreciated this as much as I have because, um, you know, we never stop learning. So, um, well, thank you guys for having me on. I hope it was helpful. And uh, I hope everyone that participated gained something from it. And uh, if anyone has questions that come up after, you know, if they want to post them on the site, I'll just tag me in it and I'll try to answer. That's great. That's great. Um, well, one other thing, I, I always forget the uh, I always forget the, the action step. How did everybody do with? Um, John needs to unmute himself. Just a minute. (laughs) There we go. All right. I'm unmuted now. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. That's good. So this is the second time that I've seen that, and uh, then and again, it just completely blows me away. So Christina, thank you so much for that. It was really awesome. Uh, I, I I I learned more again. It's like, um, so just so much great information in that in that uh, video. Um, a lot of people ask if we're going to do more about people, but um, that session had just as much. I think you can apply just as much to people as you can to horses and to pets and uh, just a tremendous amount of information in that 
that that with some really solid research behind it that uh, people. Um, um, Sorry about that, guys. It's really completely changed the way that uh, the, the main the the main um, myths were thought of. So. Um, there's a couple of questions in the um, group, uh, higher intensity, yeah. lower frequency. Yes. Yes, Sherry. A uh, question about laminitis. Uh, Christina, have you had any uh, experience with treating laminitis? Um, I have. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of walking around my house at the moment, so bear with me. But um, I have, and the biggest case that I had um, actually is a mare that is fairly young and was in foal. Um, can you guys hear me okay? No, barely. Yep. You can, okay. Uh, so, um, and this is the most recent one. And this was a mare that was down. Um, she's in foal. And they were really on the cusp of just having to euthanize her. The laminitis was so bad. Um, we went out, um, I actually rented my machine to them. I was going out of town. So I rented my machine to them um, for four days. Um, they, I gave them instructions, showed them how to use it. I don't recommend renting your machine out unless that's what you do. <laughs> um, but I happen to know this person very well, so um, was okay with that. And um, they pulsed her three times a day for an hour each session. Um, like I said, the mayor was down. Um, she would get up occasionally to pee. Um, she would not even get up to, you know, to poop or anything. Um, and so she was laying down for probably a good maybe 20 hours out of the day. And this was her last shot of whether she might survive or not. Uh, they pulsed her an hour, three times a day. Um, putting the loops directly on her hooves while she was laying down. Um, and I should correct that. They did an hour on each hoof on the on her fronts, which is where she was laminitic. Um, and by the time I got back, she was standing. She was wanting to go outside. Um, you know, she is dutiful here any day now and has survived, kept her weight on, and is doing great. Um, I have had another one that did make it um you know so i i think that it's just a matter of perseverance a little bit with it um the one that didn't make it we were not pulsing we didn't approach it the same way that this pregnant mayor that we did with the pregnant mayor um you know i didn't run the machine out to them we weren't doing each hoof for an hour three times a day you know, and that it's not the most practical way to go, but I happen to have had the opportunity to do that by letting them, you know, rent my machine. So I was just reading some, some of the comments on uh, some of the, in the chat and um, if you guys um, want to ask some questions, we just have really just a few more minutes that, and uh, happy to have Christina with us. So if you've got questions you want to ask, go ahead and ask them. Um, you can either uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask them directly or, or put them in the chat either way. Um, but uh, happy to hear that Christina is probably a lot warmer than it was when we did that, that, uh, that video. I was sitting there in my coat. I know you were freezing. Mm -hmm. Um, Paula is asking, she has a horse, um, how do you get them to stand for 90 minutes? I'm currently treating a not so nice gelding with a DDFT injury. The sesamoid bone is like cottage cheese. If I get 30 minutes on just his leg, I'm doing good. He is so body sore, I'm having to do full body and leave the loop on the injured leg as long as he will tolerate it. I so want to sedate him to get some really awesome PMF on that injury, but I'm frustrated. Um, I have had that. Do you have any comments? Yeah, I've had to have, I've had to do that before. Um, you know, it's definitely not the most ideal, uh, but I have had, you know, I've had instances um, with two horses in particular where 
number one, the injuries were so severe to even get the PMF on the horse, the vets had to sedate it. And they really, they just, I think that in one of them they did Domosedan and then the other, they gave it some ACE. Um, I, if I'm going to have it done, you know, if I, if I'm working on a horse that has to be sedated, personally, I kind of prefer the ACE because they're still pretty much with you, uh, where Domosedan, they're kind of checked out. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, uh, but it takes the edge off and calms them down. Um, so if you're going to do it, I'm personally, you know, my preference is for the, for, to do ACE, but I have had to have them sedate a horse to get the treatment done. Um, usually after a couple of sessions, they kind of understand and you don't have to continue to do that. But the DDF tears, um, you know, my experience with those is they take an awful lot of um, pulsing. And so... You know, you got to kind of settle in for the long haul with that. You've got a, a horse that is naughty. Um, you know, um, I usually I ask the owner, where is it the most comfortable? Where does this horse, like, is he most comfortable in his stall? Is he most comfortable? Where is the horse relaxed? And wherever that is, that's where I work. If the horse is antsy in the cross ties, then I'm not going to ask them to bring him into the cross ties. I am setting myself up for failure or a lot of frustration at the very least. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, Sam, Sam isn't on tonight, but um, Sam actually prefers to do all horses in the stall. She, she doesn't do any horses in cross ties and she doesn't even, she prefers to not tie them, you, you know, um, so I don't know what other people's experiences are with that, but uh, um, she just feels like being able to, you know, get in that, you know, make that connection with the horse, be in a more quiet surrounding, and uh, um, I don't know, that, that works the best for her. So Yeah, my preference personally is um, wherever the horse is the most comfortable. Um, and you know, I have, I have clients horses who really aren't stalled or they're stall pacers or weavers or things like that. I'm not going to try to work on them in a stall, but, um, I usually prefer, I mean, personal preference. I don't like it when the owners hang around. Um, if I've got a horse that requires a handler, that's a little bit different. Um, but, and I, I'm incorporating body work into what I'm doing as well. So, um, sometimes you know to have somebody help that's not a bad idea but my preference is to just be one-on-one -on -one and you know work with them wherever they're most comfortable so i would probably say probably 50 60 percent of my work is done in the stalls and the rest of it is in cross yeah i i've mostly done it in the stalls and um i've never i've never had a horse sedate sedated i've never had to sedate a horse ever um, if a horse is really, you know, being a problem, then what I do is just put the, uh, put the loop, you know, either a, a small or medium loop right on their forearm and hit that acupressure point right there. And I put it on there for four or five minutes at a pretty good intensity. And, um, usually it's sleepy time after that. And they just, uh, you know, will will go right away. <clears throat> so um, the other thing you can do is do the unwinding protocol, where you can just go up and down their back, um, you know, on on either side of their top line again with like either a small or medium loops, and just go really slowly and go up and down their back until they are just completely relaxed. <clears throat> and if you're, if they still are, are really not settling on that, good chances you might have it too high because like, um, if they're really in pain, like, um, Sherry's horse, Flora, you know, she, it took her several times, a, a bunch of times really to be able to tolerate, uh, the, the, the any kind of intensity at all. And, you know, she would get really nervous and everything, but really what she, it was is, is it was just, it was really just really affecting her. And she had some major injuries and, 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 uh, sorenesses that took her a long time to work through. And, 
and and, and both, emotional issues. And emotional, I, yeah. I need to share that in our group. I need to share that the story of Flora because she, it, my own personal horse was our most sensitive horse we ever pulsed. The most sensitive horse, and then uh, after working through that, we, I mean. After the first time that we did a full body on her, she literally broke out in a sweat from head to toe. Um, she would pee and squirt like she was in season. Um, she would rear up. She would freak out. I mean, it was, yeah. it was unbelievable. She would just sit and, there and go uh, like, oh. I have some and really good like, oh. Yeah. But and it was that too. she had such energy blocks and was so sensitive that we – we it, it was unbelievable and and we had to do it so lightly and so gradually until we broke through that and uh had amazing breakthroughs with her but i'll, I'll share the story of that because um and then my own acupuncturist shared with me which i'll also um share because I, I i did a write-up from Aaliyah on that is that um Water is a medium for change. And so crying, sweating, peeing, um, all these are things that are releasing toxins and, and creating a, uh, like a, um, a modality of change. So for Flora, that, that her sweating was part of her processing all the changes and things that were going on in her body. It, it's amazing. It, it was amazing. Uh, the horse, she, a different horse, she moves different, her body's different. Um, it, it, now she loves to be, now she loves to be pulsed. And it's, it's still at a lighter intensity probably than most, but, but um, it was like we had to but pretty normal. whatever yeah. she had that. Pretty normal. Pretty normal, yeah. Pretty normal. And she's beautiful and I love her. Have you experienced that, Christina? With, uh, we were just talking. We kind of lost you there for a minute. And yeah, I don't know if you that. ever saw the story that I posted about my own horse, Flora, that was so unbelievably sensitive. And, um, you know, I just wondered if you've ever experienced anything like that. Um, I didn't catch the whole story, and I apologize um, because I lost my signal, um, and uh, I had to reboot my phone, um, so I apologize, but um, I mean, I have definitely worked on some very hypersensitive horses. Um, I had one last week that, I, um, you know, she, the horse was, I mean, it was pulsing so hard, and I barely had the machine on. I mean, I, and I have an EQX, so, um, but I had, I literally just, just turned it on and the horse's body was just pulsing like crazy. And it was, well, okay. that was our experience. Yeah. With Flora, the first, do you remember John, the first time we ever pulsed her, we barely, um, had it on and she reared up and smashed her head and split her head open. We had to have the vet come out to give her stitches. That oh, no. <laughs> my oh, own personal horse, the first time we, we pulsed her. Well, and what, I, so this has been my experience for, you know, who's ever interested. Um, but as a body worker, what I have found with some of those really hypersensitive horses, is um, a couple of different things that have gone on. Um, we have found them to be pretty dehydrated. Um, so I've encouraged them to add some electrolytes, especially before we did another session, um, whether they have to give you know a paste or something, but they'll add some electrolytes and then give the horse an opportunity to have water. Um, that has helped with that. And the other thing is, is that um, they usually are fighting something. Um, the ones that I have referred back to the veterinarians, um, typically I can, I mean, I, I'm pretty in tune to what tissue is supposed to feel like. And usually with those horses, now I can say, oh, wow, there's something that's going on with this horse. I might not know what it is. Um, and most of the time I don't, but if I refer them back to the vet and they get some blood work or something, almost every time 
they either are dehydrated or they're dehydrated and they're fighting some kind of an illness. And the majority of them, it's been tick-borne. Um, it doesn't mean that that's what it is, but, you know, I've seen them do it with dehydration and come back with blood work that's just fine and just be dehydrated. Yes. The yeah, one of the few, systemic, one of the few horses that most of them have had something. Um, no, that's that. They've been fighting some kind of infection. The, the lower, their lower apartment. I'm glad I got Okay. Yeah, one of the few horses that that had that kicked me was at a, a two-year-old training sale, and and he just didn't settle in, and he was like really really agitated. The, the the trainer though was standing was was very very negative and was standing and yelling at the uh, at the groom the entire time. Where so I I wasn't quite sure if it was that, but the next day that horse came down with shipping fever, and he was very dehydrated so yeah. so it was both both the all or like all three of those things were not good situations and since then i've learned that if you're if you do have an owner i saw a comment about uh i think it was paul or that you know when the owner comes down the horse starts acting really you know naughty and it's like then it is it is best to as politically as possible to say that you you know you would like to work on the horse privately and that uh you know you, you can do a better job if you do that and and uh or stop working you know and if they ask them what's wrong just say you know i'm i'm a lot less politically correct nowadays than i than i used to be although i never really was too politically correct but i would just say that uh you know they need to leave <laughs> <laughs> they're bothering the horse they need they're bothering the horse and they're bothering me so leave uh. um, i'm you know i can't say that i'm less politically correct but uh you know i have i'm i tend to be like you know what um i mean i had to tell a lady today working on a horse to please stop touching the horse while i'm working on it and she was like oh why and i'm like you are interrupting him every single time he yeah. stops participating in what i'm doing and he starts to focus on you he checks out to what i'm trying to do in his tissue and he listens to you and she's like oh no he just loves me okay fine he can love you when i'm done right but for now right. and i mean i, I was a little she was a brand new client but i'm like you have got to back off and um the horse was lit trying to lick her like a lot he was trying to lick literally lick her and she's like oh you're being bad she kept disciplining him and i asked her i said look i said if that's uncomfortable for you i'm you're welcome to walk away i can handle it but i need you to stop disciplining him because this is his way of expression and said does he lick all the time she goes you've never done this before i don't know why he's doing it now and i said okay then can we just let him do what he needs to do. If you don't want to be licked, I understand the risk of being bit or something, but walk away. I'll take the lead rope. You can go get coffee. <laughs> like, but you got to you gotta stop interrupting the session. And she was quite offended. And then when she saw her horse when it was done, she wasn't offended anymore. But, you know, I, we'll see if she calls me back because he's going to need a lot more work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually asked somebody once if they could get me a cup of coffee, and they and I said, you know, I really, really could use a cup of coffee, and they just weren't getting the hints. And I like, God, I really could use a cup of coffee. I'm like, well, I have to go all the way into the house to get that. I'm like, that well, would, yeah, well, that would be good. They brought the coffee back. I'm like, no, no, thanks. Uh, not yeah. John. John? I used to be a lot nicer about it as well, but I mean, there's only so many hours a day. There's a lot of horses that I have to get to, and I I kind of just don't have time to sit there and dance around it. I need to get my work done. Yeah. And I mean, not that I ever want to rush, but I still have to be efficient. And you know, I it's the way it is. Yeah, it's part of the bedside treatment. You know, you 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 learn the different techniques in order to be able to you know work at your at your best. And if the owner is causing a problem, then it's better to just to uh, be upfront with it. And if they're if they can't handle it, well, then they're probably not going to be a long term client anyway. So, um, yeah. So we're we're past our time, but um, well, wait, I think Veronica had a question. 
Veronica, did you have a question? Yes, I haven't worked on any horses yet, but we're supposed to be working on quarter horses. Is there anything that I should know about the quarter horses when you're working with them? They're just like any other horse. Okay. I, mean, I would say the biggest thing I've ever had with quarter horses is they, they tend to dehydrate them. I don't know why. They just seem to think that dehydrating the horses make them work better. Well, it's because they give, they give too much water in their system. They give them Lasix and that. Well, the Lasix for sure. But yeah, I don't know why quarter horse as, a, as if I, I was going to say one thing about quarter horses pops in my mind is like they always seem to be dehydrated, you know. So um, do the old pinch, pinch tests and see if, they're, if you pinch their skin and their skin sticks together. It's like, you know, make sure they, they drink a lot of water. water. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, do they have access to water. Uh huh. Put, put their yeah. Put their just when you're doing you know treat them in the stall and and put the rope over the water bucket so they're just standing over water. Like, yeah. Okay. Them, they restrict the the access to water. Now, can I ask you also, John? Um, now, when you guys when you, like some of these trainers have like a hundred horses. Now, do you give them like a package deal type thing when you're doing? their horses and give them a discount or I do especially if yeah especially if you can go from horse to horse to horse to horse mm -hmm. sure. so are you doing like $75 or $50 instead you, of the if you can go right down the head the, the the if you can go right down the thing and they're going to keep you busy by all means yeah okay now, what, I, the only thing I would tell you is um when it comes this is my experience my personal thoughts on discounting um, it's one thing to say, okay, if you have all of these horses and you know, then I'm happy to do that. But if you're going to discount it, they prepay, they pay in advance for however many horses it is. Um, because if they don't, what you're going to find is you just got cheated because as you get out there, they'll be like, oh, you know what? I'm going to take that one off the list or I'll take that one off the list. Next thing you know, you were out there for 10 horses and you're doing seven. Uh, and you're doing it for a lot less. So if you do a package deal, it's paid for in advance. Um, and don't go so low that you're diminishing the value of what you offer. Now, what would be a good price for that as far as if you're, you're doing 10 how horses? How many horses again? Well, I don't know. He's, they said his stall has like 100 horses, but I don't think I'm going to be pimping all those. You know, I'm going to do them all at once. Yeah, yeah. No. So and I would, I would do what for sure. What I would do is, is I, I would sell them packages and say, you know, I'll come out here and if I can go from horse to horse, my absolute best price is if I go from horse to horse, horse. Christine is absolutely right. Paid in advance, scheduled in advance, and then you show up. They scheduled ten horses, and you and it's sixty dollars, so six hundred bucks for ten horses, and they only have eight horses for you to do. You get the six hundred bucks. Yeah. It's like I'm doing, I'm here to do ten horses in a row for six hundred dollars. If you only have eight of them for me to do, it's still six hundred dollars, and you just yep. gotta lay it on the line. If you're gonna discount I, beyond. I you know, beyond. The I never go, we never go below, now, John, that was in the beginning. Now we have never gone below $75, yeah. in, even in a say, package. You just, the way. one thing you got to remember is you can't go, once you go down, yeah, it's go really up. hard to go up. And I've got a thing I'm going to, I'm going to share, I'll share in our group about discounting. I, our thing is always add value. Add, what can you add as value? Can you add in sessions on the people, on the trainers, or on, on the other? I, I just, like, really, I, I do, do not discount do so low that really? you're devaluing your service, yourself, and the, the therapy. We all have to maintain a respect for the rest of practitioners. You know, it's a responsibility that we all hold, and and, and that I I could go on and on about that, but um, well, one I, thing I, that, I, that we have really just found that been been effective for for trainers is that, and you have to kind of feel them out as to how they they work. But someone that has a hundred horses, 
he's going to have some clients' horses. He's going to have some of his own horses. I just, mm -hmm. you know, and so I say, I'll do six. And clients, they just bill it right through. So whatever it is, they just bill it right through. So you say. Can I touch on that when you're done, John? Yeah. So they go, oh, I'll do six horses for $600. And then every, every $600 I do, I'll do two of yours for free or, or one of yours for free. And you, you'll be, every time you get there, they'll have six horses for you, you know, or whatever the deal is, five horses in one, 10 horses in one, whatever the deal is, you really just have to feel them out. But if you say, then, then, then he gets his horses done for free and he gets his client's horses done for the regular price. Now, do you, do you, do you sell package, packages like, like 10 sessions for a certain are amount? Me? Are you asking me? Yeah, just yeah, anybody. Oh, okay. Paid up um, front, scheduled up front. I, you know, I'll be honest with you. Is it Veronica? Yes. Um, I am not a fan of discounting. The only time I really discount something is if I'm working on an injury and I know I'm going to be out there all the time. And it Got is 100% it. prepaid. I do not discount anything if it's not paid in advance. Um, and they know that if they don't use up the sessions or if they cancel on me or something, um, with less than 24 hours notice, they're charged, for, like that comes out of what their sessions were. Okay. Um, because my time, I mean, I my time is valuable. I only have so many hours in the day and if I'm not working, I'm not making any money. And yeah. so, um, you know, if you're going to do a big package, like you have an opportunity of a barn that has a hundred horses in it. Um, like Sherry mentioned, if you, you have to consider that there's a trainer involved there. Yes. Um, I don't even give anything away. I mean, I don't, it is a rare day that I give something away for free. And if I do it, I do it because just totally out of the goodness of my heart. I'm not doing it because I want to earn their business. I'm not doing it for any of those reasons. Cause it, the minute I do that, they take advantage of me. Yeah. And so I don't, I learned the hard way. I don't do that. Um, so, but if you have an opportunity to get into the barn, this is the thing. If he knows, if you, that barn owner knows that you charge a hundred dollars a session and then he asks you for a package and that's all client horses, I guarantee you he is billing that client what your regular price is oh, and really? pocketing the difference. Oh, interesting. I guarantee it. Um, and so who are you passing the discount along to? Got it. So if you if you want to go in and say, look, for all of your horses, the trainer's horses, I will give you a trainer discount where I will take $10 or $15 off of each horse that you schedule. Um, and, you know, your horses get done at the end of the day, like uh -huh. all of the full paying customers get done first. Yes. Then, by what? all means. I'm trying to get in my pencil. I'm sorry. Sorry, write notes down. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Um, but if it's not one of his horses, if it's a sales horse or it's a, you know, whatever it is, and he's not the owner, then you, you know, you're, you're kind of giving the money away for free. You're, you're giving it away. And, and the only person who's getting a benefit or he's getting all the benefit you're getting hurt. Well, see this I, gentleman, that's a trainer that my cousin used to be a trainer at Los Alamitos, the quarter horses. And he knows all these trainers. He's like the number one trainer there. And then he introduced me to two other trainers and this other lady says she has clients, but she has like a hundred horses. So that falls in category. Like I'm going to say, this is what it costs and she's going to go bill them higher. And then. So just say, this is what it costs. And like a farrier, you know, here's the invoice. And if you do actually invoice and document your sessions and they have to share that with their client, their client's going to know what they paid and there shouldn't be upcharges on that, you know, unless they have like a holding fee or whatever they have. Um, but that saves you from looking like you overcharge or whatever. So documentation is going to be important for you. Um, and then, um, you know, quite like, quite honestly, I just, avoid discounting at all costs go in there and say i mean your service has a value and if they're already excited about it the other barns that you're working with have already told her what you charge got it so yeah and i just went to her barn and charge less and then she's gonna go well she's only charging me like 90 dollars or 85 dollars for my 100 horses they're gonna be like well 
why am I getting charged more? I just, I'm not a fan of discounting. If you can avoid it, don't do it. Okay. Especially if you're in with a big barn like that and, and there you have multiple, multiple things, you're going to get to the point where you're like, I, I, I'm maxed out. You know, I'm going to take care of my full paying clients first. Yep. And then, and, and the discounting clients aren't going to get their, their shot. And the other way that really great to, to, to do that is that you have a, a pricing sheet and they uh -huh. ask you what your prices are. You just give it to them. You don't say anything. You just like, this is what my prices are. And if it's written down, they're like, Oh, that's what I guess the prices are. They may ask you if you discount, just say, this is what I'm getting. And that's all. And you just leave it at that. Yeah. Usually the, usually you'll get to the point when you're really busy, people don't ask about discounts anymore. When you're just starting out, <laughs> no, then they, they ask about discounts, you know? Well, that's our fear is like, we don't give someone a discount. They're not going to come back. And that's with people. Cause that's really hard with people. Yeah. But you know, people, even with like, I work on humans too. I'm a licensed massage therapist and I work on people. I, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm expensive. I mean, people are not where I want to be spending my time. And so I charge an awful lot to work on a human being. <laughs> really? Wow. I mean, I just, I do. And they still come back. Wow. Every one of them. Yeah. They still you know, come back. That's the old, the old rule is like, you get what you pay for. And a lot of people, like I said, you discount too much. People don't appreciate it. And they're like, oh, well, why do I want to do this? You know, and it's not like it's yeah. something special. Right. Yep. Right. You get to the point though where you you'll be busy enough where you like someone says discount you go uh you know I'm not really sure if I have to schedule you know time on my schedule for you you know it's like I I am I mean I'm at a point now I mean I, I do body work also so you know I it, I can't do 10 horses in a day I just I can't do it so on average I I try to stick to 5 I'm usually doing 7 and you know I like to try to get a day off of work here and there, but I have not had a full day off where I have not worked on a single horse since last fall when I went on vacation. Wow. Um, I mean, there has been, and if I walk into a barn to do one, I'm staying to do four. I, I mean, it's not worth my time to drive to a barn to do one horse. So if I'm going to go out there, I'm going out there. And, um, you know, most barns, I won't, I mean, I'm at a point where I, I'm, I have the luxury and I'm blessed enough that I can say, you know what, look, you know, if you can get more horses, I'll come out, but I don't, it doesn't take much for me to fill my schedule at all. I mean, I, I have trouble finding time oh, nice. for myself. So. Okay. Well, thank you for the information. You're welcome. Somebody just popped up a question about the weather and like when it was really bad outside. Oh, did you pulse during the horrible part of the the winter this year? With the exception of that big polar vortex and the two blizzards, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but only in heated barns. Uh, you know, again, I have the luxury to say no to an unheated barn. And so, but the polar vortex um, where I live are... Um, the temperature got down with the wind chill down to negative 62. And yeah, I'm not going outside for that. That's no. cold. I, I'm lucky that I was like willing to get out of bed. <laughs> That's dangerous. Yes. It is. Yeah. Frostbite in less than five minutes on exposed skin. So no thanks. Yeah. My daughter's in Illinois. She said she had the same problem. She got off work and she says it was horrible. I mean, couldn't even see. Yeah. Trying to drive home. She goes, because mm -mm, she's in the Air Force. And so she says, so she didn't live that far. She goes, but it was like blind leading the blind. You couldn't, you just had to, hopefully you were on the road. <laughs> well, in the blizzards, I mean, I don't bother to go out in the blizzards, but with the polar vortex, it was beautiful and sunny out and, you know, 62 below. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, I don't blame you. But Right. I remember that it was, it like literally took your breath away. Like you couldn't breathe. It was so cold. It oh, does. God. It literally oh. freezes the air in your lungs. Yeah, yeah. that's what they were saying on TV. They were saying, make sure you wear a mask and cover your eyes. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
I didn't leave the house. I mean, I like didn't go outside. That's smart. Nope. Yeah. Thankfully, spring is here. It's spring, and we all have a, a wonderful spring and summer to look forward to. So, well, well we already we already had ninety degree weather. No, oh, I'm not oh, there yet. Gosh. So. This last weekend was ninety, and then this coming Monday is going to be in the nineties again. Oh my God! Yeah. I'm not ready for that. I'm not <laughs> ready for that but, well, yeah. are, are there other questions? Well, this is left. No, Any that's all questions? I Well, thank you so much, Christina. Thanks for everybody for showing up and uh, listening to a, a, a great presentation. And um, you guys got some great stories to tell. And uh, there's a there's this vet out in California that swears that they're an FEI vet. Oh, you can't re redo nerves. I'm like, I got to get you to meet Christina. <laughs> yeah. So, yep, they're yeah, to yeah. and everybody, yeah, don't forget about our private group. If you think of any questions after today, go ahead in our private group, ask questions, share your success stories. Um, let's keep the conversation going in our group after our, uh, after our class. So, okay, thank you, Christine. Thanks, good guys. luck, good so luck everybody thank out you. there. Thank you Have so fun. much, yeah.